mentioned, I'm uh, I'm the CEO of Metafold 3D. We're a, a startup uh, located here in Toronto. We're creating design software for additive manufacturing, and we're doing it from a very mathematical perspective. So I'm a mathematician, and uh, today I want to talk about how geometry, how much opportunity, of course, there is in geometry, but also some of the challenges that face, um, that we face really, uh, you know, capturing those opportunities using 3D printing. So I'm going to start by going back in time, actually. So this image is from 18, the 1880s, uh, and it's a, an image of a minimal surface. These were first considered in the 1700s, and then it was in the late 1800s when uh, Neovius and Schwartz started thinking about periodic minimal surfaces. And so what is a minimal surface? It is something that is locally area minimizing. And the, the example everyone knows is a soap bubble. If you kind of have a soap uh, film stretched around a boundary, it's going to take the, the, the shortest path, be so minimal. And the triply periodic uh, minimal surfaces are minimal surfaces that are, are periodic. They repeat uh, and they create these really beautiful and um, turns out super useful lattice structures. But so my point here, and I'm gonna share another image from Schwartz, my point with these pictures is that these, this is the extent of what existed in the 1800s on minimal surfaces. These mathematicians, they thought these things up, they proved they existed. There's a, a very um, precise mathematical definition. And the mathematicians um, proved that these surfaces existed, but had no way to make them material. So we knew they existed, but they were just kind of like a, a, an abstract mathematical concept. And even in the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, Schoen, Alan Schoen picked up this thread while working at NASA. And many of you are now probably familiar with the, the gyroid, which is a, a very beautiful and self-supporting minimal surface with a very kind of compact description. But um, again, these were kind of just uh, abstract ideas in this technical note, which I totally advise you to look at. It's incredible. Um, Schoen actually worked with a, with a sculptor, I, I think who was also on staff at NASA, to make these physical models of the gyroid, which I think is completely incredible. And um, Nicholas's talk really inspired me in this way as well, uh, the, these kind of cross-disciplinary approaches. But 3D printing has changed all of this. It has given us the ability to actually manufacture these shapes. So that's really my first point, is that it's worth kind of reflecting on this, that 3D printing gives us access to new kinds of shapes that we really didn't have access to with any other manufacturing methodology. And this in, you know, includes the, the triply periodic minimal surfaces that I was just talking about, I really like that example because they're so efficient, but it goes well beyond that as well and into different kinds of lattice structures as well. And it turns out that these shapes are super useful for stuff. So that's where I, I wanna go next. Uh, let's look at some of the places where these surfaces and, and shapes turn out to be useful. So um, cell scaffolds and bioreactors, these are an incredible, I love this application so much. Because what's happening here is that we're using those triply periodic minimal surfaces uh, to effectively pack surface area into a small volume. And this allows us to do things like grow cells very efficiently. And actually, I loved seeing this in uh, Nicholas's talk that um, we can uh, you know, explore the way different geometries contribute to, to cell growth. Um, so I'm just noticing that my slides are a little bit cut off. All right, hold on. Can I just, I'm just going to adjust this so that you can see the entire slide. Um, let me reshare. Hopefully that looks a little bit better. Yeah, so talked about bioreactors and cell scaffolds. We can also control flow using these different shapes with, with fluid flow. This has all kinds of different applications. In some cases, we want to maximize the, the texture to maximize adhesion. Um, this is the case in a lot of uh, implants where you're looking for bone growth and you're trying to create a lot of surface area for bone to grow on. 
And then a whole kind of separate concept is that we can really dial in the material properties. And what I mean is that we can take these different lattice structures and um, use them uh, strategically to get different material behaviors. So here are some examples of different uh, beam lattices. Each of these is going to have a different performance under compression, and we can use those. You know, we can tune um, tune our our prints to actually have the material behaviors we want. And so a lot of people are using this, for instance, in orthotics uh, or other places where you have compressive forces. And they actually kind of are very good at replacing foam um, with the ability to control via geometry the performance as compared to foam, where you have to control everything via chemistry, which is much more difficult. Now we have the ability to kind of dial this in uh, geometrically. One thing that people actually don't know as well is that um, some of the materials that are being used actually contribute to not just better performance, better cushioning, but also greater breathability, hygiene, and a longer life. Um, everyone's familiar with those Adidas shoes with a cool 3D printed midsole. If you actually have a pair of those shoes for a long time, you will notice that the, the upper will wear out and the very bottom will wear out, but that midsole is still going strong many years later. So there's many opportunities here for really long lasting um, products that totally outcompete foam. And then finally, customization is really also at the heart of, um, of the benefits of, of 3D printing and geometry is really at the heart of customization. And we can even go further with these different lattices and structures to really tune these, um, these products, in this case, a, an, an insole or an orthotic for the particular patient. So thinking then about the benefits of additive manufacturing for medical applications, I am biased but I do believe that geometry really is at the root of these benefits. And, um, oh, sorry, so what does this lead to? Geometry leads to better design, more optimal designs, more control over what we are producing. It leads to customization of those designs, which in turn lead to better, um, better outcomes for our patients. We can also see sustainability benefits here. We're able to use less materials, they last longer. And all of these things contribute to new opportunities, right? So lower costs for some applications, new business models, an empowerment of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to prototype and get things to market more quickly. Now this tree picture, I like this tree. So I'm in Canada, we've got the maple tree. But uh, the other thing is that I see these things flowing through the geometric infrastructure. And this is really where design comes in. Design, geometric infrastructure, everything needs to go through this in order to realize those benefits. And in my view, hard geometry problems are holding back innovation in the entire 3D printing industry, including medical 3D printing. And this is why we started Metafold, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about this. If we are doing our job at Metafold, then my hope is that you, all you folks working in incredible applications in 3D printing in the medical space, you shouldn't be worried about geometry, file sizes, processing times, and so on. You should be focused on making the best products and innovations for your applications. And you know some of the, some of the things we've been hearing about today are, are totally amazing and game-changing. So I want to play a little game here, and I, I love the reactions that uh, I'm seeing. I want to play a game of Have You Ever? So hopefully I can get some, some thumbs up here. No hearts, though, because these are all bad things. So have you ever had your design software crash mid-operation? Has anyone had that happen? Seeing a few. Had you, have you ever had a file that was too big for your service bureau or print prep software to handle? I think large file sizes are a, usually a challenge for people who are doing high surface area work. Have you ever been unable to export a tetrahedral mesh, a good one for simulation? Not everyone does simulation, but if you have, usually some headaches. Have you ever been unable to automate a geometric procedure over a range of input data? 
So maybe you're working with patient scans and you find yourself needing to do a ton of clicking, many hours of clicking. Okay, great. How about, have you ever needed geometric functionality that wasn't available out of the box in your design software? Yeah. And what about this? Have you ever struggled to commercialize an innovation because of the reliance on proprietary CAD software? So that's a more subtle one, but I think a lot of people are recognizing tools like um, like Grasshopper and Rhino, which I love, by the way, been a long time Grasshopper user, but it can be hard. You can develop a great algorithm in Grasshopper and then you go to commercialize it and you don't have good options. So if you answered yes to any of these questions, and I love the reactions there, then um, it, geometry is holding you back. And so this is really why we started Metafold to address uh, these issues and actually others that are fundamentally about the geometric infrastructure for additive manufacturing. And again, this is how I see the value of additive manufacturing being delivered. So I wanna share um, a few insights that led us to doing what we're doing at Metafold. And the first is that explicit geometry representations are unsuitable for 3D printing. So this is, um, this is an observation about representing geometry, and this is kind of a behind the scenes observation. So this is not really the kind of thing you should worry about, but I wanna give you a, an understanding of what's, what's happening. So geometry representation, how do we capture, store, or manipulate geometry digitally? And this is, in my opinion, at the heart of design for additive manufacturing or DFAM. So I think that for, for DFAM, geometry representation needs to take a sharp right turn over into the space of implicit modeling. So what, what is that? So let's first define what explicit representation is. Explicit representation is, is what you're seeing in this, this bunny, where we are using a bunch of little surfaces to describe a shape. So a triangle mesh is a perfect example of this, as is like a B-wrap model or NURBS, uh, NURBS surface. Or a, so you like your STL file is a triangle mesh. In contrast, an implicit representation is a continuous function that describes the shape. And so typically this is actually um, a signed distance field where everywhere inside the shape, the signed distance field is, uh, is negative and outside the shape, it is positive. So the central idea is that the surface of the shape is the set of points where the function is zero. And I'm willing to bet that most of you took calculus. So you will know what this is. This is an implicit function and it defines the unit circle. So this is like, you, you know what implicit functions are. And the point is we can do this for 3D shapes as well. So this one here is an, appro it's an approximation of the gyroid. I have to say that, that it is an approximation. This doesn't define the gyroid, but it does approximate it very, very nicely. Um, and so the trick is, how do we build up definitions of three-dimensional shapes that are continuous functions that are these sine distance fields? And if we can answer that question, then we have a very robust description of shape that is very much more powerful. So let me give you an example. Um, and this comes back to my point about surface area. We're really good with 3D printing at maximizing surface area. We're good at making these lattice structures but you do not want to try to capture that with a whole bunch of little tiny surfaces. That's when you end up with giant files that you can't print. So definitely don't mesh this, this is just a gyroid, or this, making this um, you know, just a finer gyroid, or this, and we can kind of keep going, right? So, but each of these gyroids, it's the same equation. So this is kind of, the value of implicit modeling that you have this very compact, concise description, you skip all the massive files and, um, and you're able to scale. And that is what is so exciting to me when I see the, the work that uh, colleagues are doing in medical 3D printing and elsewhere, where you have a need for high surface area, high complexity structures, and you need to, you want to scale them. Like you, you might build a, a small prototype but it's not good enough. We need we need to go further um, and scale this. So again, that's the, the concept of the geometric infrastructure that's at the heart of these innovations. 
The second insight that uh, I want to share is this idea that truly differentiated products require differentiated tooling. And this is kind of obvious when you think about traditional manufacturing and the factory setups, the, the physical tooling that goes into making things. Um, but as what we're talking about digital manufacturing, of course, tooling moves digital. So we need this very special software to achieve our outcomes, our differentiated parts. And we see the need for um, kind of very, very flexible software tools that can be integrated into a variety of workflows. So more specifically, we can think about it like this. We have a, a geometric modeling kernel. This is fundamentally what we do at Metafold. We create a geometric modeling kernel uh, and this is offered via API. OEMs can take this and customize it and then they can build out their internal tools to create their products or they can also build commercial products because increasingly uh, to really commercialize some of these things, there's a software element. It's not just enough to produce the parts. You actually be, need to produce software as well as the parts. And in 3D printing, everything needs geometry. Everything needs design. And that's really at the heart of, of scale. The So digital, in, digital tooling requires geometric infrastructure. Again, that's what we're working on. And then the final uh, observation perspective I want to share is that CAD and actually everything is moving to the cloud. And there's lots of good reasons for this. Um, you know, there's a chip shortage. Uh, you might want to design on whatever device you happen to have at, at hand. Uh, links and sharing is a, is a really big deal. And I would argue security is also a really big deal. So having the ability to track uh, you know, where information is going. People think it's going to be better that it's on-prem, but often it's actually better for it to be trackable and uh, link-based. So in summary then, for additive manufacturing to succeed, we really need design tools that are robust, easy, accessible, integrated, scalable, fast, um, more informed, faster design iteration, and so on. This is kind of our, our wish list when we, we set about to, um, to launch a, a design product. And so at Metafold, we have uh, we have two things. We're really, as I said, a group of, of nerds dedicated to handling challenging geometry problems so that you folks can get on with your, your, your innovation and your work. Um, but we offer a, a web platform for design and simulation. I haven't really touched on simulation, but this is also super important um, with the implicit functions. You know, you can, it's one thing to design implicit functions. It's another thing to, to simulate them and traditional methods don't work there. So we've come up with our own take on simulation. And we also offer our geometry kernel via API. And this is to address the need for automation, scale, flexibility, um, organizations to build and scale internal or commercial geometry rich applications. So that's what we're doing. Um, if I have a, a few more minutes, I would love to share a case study. Is that uh, okay, Jenny? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. So yeah, I do have a few case studies. Um, and I, I want to share this one actually, because this is on the, the bioreactor use case. And it's so exciting to me because it uh, it could be a, a true step change for regenerative medicine. Um, so this is with the Southwest Research Institute. They, I mean, I to take zero credit for bioreactor anything, but they developed this incredible 3D printed bioreactor. It could replace hundreds of manual operation flat flasks at a fraction of the cost, but it took them literally months to design what you're seeing on screen here. So it's a very small bioreactor. They recognized the possibility of this. They knew it had huge potential, but they were completely stuck in how to scale this, how to make it commercially viable. Um, so I think our contact said he spent uh, uh, 30 days of man hours and he ended up with a 16 gigabyte file, which uh, was just untenable. So, 
they started using Metafold. They cut their design time into just like, honestly, an hour maybe to reproduce the bioreactor. So they were very happy about that. And then they used the API to connect directly with the printer that they were using, um, which was an Asika printer, to increase the yield of the bioreactor by um, maybe 100x. So really excited about that, um, that application. Another one that I think uh, is, is really nice is this company, Salia. They're out of the ETH in Zurich. And they're they're doing salt printing for lab grown meat. So they actually they print these um, structures in salt, and then they use that to cast. Um, I think it's a cellulose structure that can then be used as a cell scaffold for lab grown meat. Pretty incredible. The way they use Metafold is to dial in the porosity of those um, those tubular structures, the the gyroids and the other minimal surfaces that create those scaffolds. And then the final, just to make this more concrete, um, one of uh, our customers is a, a footwear brand who's developed some really pro interesting proprietary tech around orthotics uh, and using these this concept of tail tailorable material properties to deliver medical insoles. So their goal is to access clinicians but their challenge was that their algorithms were locked into you know, their CAD systems and they recognized that the clinicians are not gonna be CAD designers. They, they, they're, that's just not what they're doing. So they wanted to build out a simplified uh, application for clinicians to use to fashion these um, orthotics. And so they're using Metafold's API. We handle all of the, the geometry. Uh, and they're able to build out their their application that can be uh, you know just tailored to their application, and it scales with them because we're all cloud based. So that's that's really the the full story. I did want to share some projects with you. So uh, Metafold has a free tier of our application. Um, I would love for you to try it out and give me your feedback. And I'm just gonna pop these a few links in the chat here. Um, these are four projects, so you can take your pick. There are four projects, pick one, and if you want to sign up, just click that purple button at the top that says duplicate this into your workspace. It'll open up the project in your own workspace. You can tinker, see what's under the hood, how it all works, and uh, yeah, give me your feedback. I would love to love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your attention and welcome your, your questions. Thanks, Elisa. I, I would say you're like a master of Zoom. Um, I have never seen this many of emoji engagements. <laughs> Either you uh, planted the audience with all your fans or... I I'm wish. Just <laughs> no, I think it's not. I'm just joking about that, obviously. Um, so we have a couple questions from the audience and we probably have more. So feel free to put it in the box. Uh, one is, um, how does Metafold fit into the ecosystem, existing design analysis, software like and topology, et cetera? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So uh, NTOP is another great example of an implicit modeling platform. They, uh, they're, yeah, they've done a great job of getting, getting this out into the minds of uh, users of additive manufacturing. One of the key differences is that um, there's a few, but the, I highlighted both of them actually. One is that we are in the cloud. This means you can use this um, like on your tablet if you want, on your Mac, uh, anywhere you design. And this is becoming uh, increasingly important as people need to scale up their capabilities. Um, then they don't need to buy new high performance workstations for each employee who's going to be using this uh, kind of software. Uh, but we also see this as, you know, as I mentioned, we really see this as the future of software um, because it gives the flexibility of so many more integrations. And this is what brings me to, this brings me to the second point, which is about the API that we have a, um, fundamentally our offering is this, this cloud-based geometry kernel that people can build commercial applications on top of. We have built a commercial application on top of it. And so that's kind of the thing that is maybe a competitor of Entopology. But then totally aside from that, you can take our API, you can build your own application and, and scale it. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Is there any kind of licensing fee if people want to use your software to build their own? Uh, yes. I mean, that's an API license. Happy to have that conversation with anyone interested. <laughs> Sounds good. 
Okay. Uh, another question from the audience is, um, is AI being used as part of your package? Yeah, good question. Fair question. And the answer is no, we don't, uh, not at present. Um, obviously, like the, the potentials of AI are on everyone's mind. Um, interestingly, in my opinion, AI for 3D geometry is simply not there yet. There's kind of, there's like a, tons of potential, um, but there's a huge difference. I think people don't appreciate this so much. There's a huge difference between two-dimensional images and 3D geometry. Like it's a massive difference. Uh, so there just aren't great, uh, I just don't think they're great models. That being said, one of the things I'm actually most excited about is the ability to contribute to that. So with Metafold and with our API, you can create data sets of microstructures and uh, like microstructures, lattices, all these things. And then you can do learning on those uh, on those data sets. So I think that has tremendous promise. We've taken steps in that direction. I would love to see someone, you know, really embrace it because people really want these inverse models for lattice geometry. They want to know what is the best geometry for my application. And I think ML will have a lot to say uh, in answer to that question. Uh, but at the moment, you know, we're not actively using AI under the hood. Yeah, I agree. I think we're kind of still early in the process. We don't have enough data for yep. a lot of applications. And we, we certainly will talk about it during our panel uh, discussion soon. I have a couple more questions uh, really quick. Uh, one is kind of general topic of uh, micro um, fabrication questions on a nano to micro scale. Is your software still functioning at that level? There's one person said, um, Alejandro said, you know, I have a micro CT scan of a lattice. Can Metafold help in building a mesh for finite element analysis? You have a micro CT scan of a lattice. Um, so this is interesting. One of the, yeah, like with, with scan data, it's typically yeah. some kind of volumetric format. Um, so, you know, I'd love to think about how that looks, but we, like, we are also a volumetric format. We represent things, uh, volumetrically. So there should be quite, uh, an easy pathway from that volumetric data into Metafold. Then can you create a mesh for it? Okay. Well, I, I'm going to like put the question back to you. Do you really want to create a mesh? I don't, I don't know. Um, we have our own take on simulation because typically creating a tetrahedral mesh of a lattice to run simulation is a non-starter. You can't do it past a certain scale. Um, and it's kind of uninteresting at the scale you can do it. So uh, that we, we have a, a completely meshless simulation uh, approach, which allows you to do simulation right on the implicit geometry, which we think is really powerful. And we think is the future of simulation on these kinds of, of structures. Um, and then, you know, on the other point about scale, this is kind of one of the incredible things about implicit geometry is it's I'm not going to, uh, yeah, it's kind of scale free. Um, and so we can, we can dial in the level of detail. We can export at different resolutions than we are viewing at, which makes it possible for us to have extraordinarily high resolution in export and not bog down our interface. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning uh, that you have a new simulation um, method completely, it sounds like, from fundamentally. And that is something Exa that is to yeah. explore in the future. Um, I have one last question. And also, Alejandro has some comments in the QA box for, for you, Elisa. Right. Um, but one last question is, um, can your software help users in a microfluidics space? Because you actually showed a picture with some of it, too. Yeah. I love the microfluidic space. Um, and this is a, an area we think is really exciting is the control of fluids. There's a lot of potential again in, uh, in controlling fluids. We do, so we don't have CFD in the app. We don't have computational fluid dynamics, but, um, it's, uh, something we're, we're keenly interested in. So yes, I mean, I think the short answer is absolutely. It can help because it gives you access to new kinds of structures to control flow that haven't been available elsewhere. So yes. Thank you so much. This is such a great presentation. The first time we have a mathematician actually sharing her perspective of how she, how she sees the world. We've had chemists, we have engineers, we had doctors in the past. So my pleasure. <laughs> missing, missing link here. So now I want to invite everybody